Hello, everyone. You're here for a WOLA uh, presentation on gendered violence against human rights defenders, uh, the risks that uh, social leadership um, creates for women. Hola. Usted está en esta presentación eh, sobre los liderazgos eh, de género y los riesgos de ser lideresas. Eh, si requiere eh, el canal en español, por favor toque el botón que está aquí abajo que dice eh, que parece como interpretación y puede estar en el canal de español. So um, this webinar is going to be in English with Spanish interpretation. If you want to hear it all in English, we um, will remain on this channel. And we're going to start in about just two more minutes. Y vamos a empezar en dos minutos más. Okay, I think I can start with the introduction. So, um, nuevamente, si necesita interpretación de inglés a español, por favor, cambiar al canal de español en el botón de abajo que dice interpretación. Um, so, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jimena Sanchez. I'm the director for the Andes at the Washington Office on Latin America. Uh, last week, we actually did a program uh, with Juliet de Rivero of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Office, and uh, she presented to us basically what their assessment was of the first year of the Petro administration. And one of the things that um, they mentioned was that we've seen a huge effort with this new government to highlight, prioritize, and attempt to un to address the underlying causes of human rights abuses and advance peace. But despite that, things um, still remain pretty worrisome, especially when it comes to human rights defenders. So in their last report, they basically observed a very slight improvement in terms of the number of killings of human rights defenders. They found that there was a 3% decrease in the cases that they verified of homicides between the second semester of 2022 and first semester of 2022. Also, they observed a 19% decrease in verified cases between the first semester of 2023 and the previous semester, which was July to December 2022. So they received about 113 allegations of killings of human rights defenders, and they've only verified 46 cases so far. And in those 46 cases, they found that seven were women, uh, one indigenous, one Afro-Colombian, and three Campesina uh, women. Um, they also noted that there was a very high rate of cases of child recruitment by non-state actors and criminal organizations, ongoing efforts to co-opt and supplant social organizations, and a high rate of dynamic of trafficking for sexual exploitation, especially um, leading to sexual violence against girls and adolescents. So while we see some positive steps, uh, violence across Colombia continues to directly target social leaders and human rights leaders. Unfortunately, at WOLA, we are forever putting out urgent actions based upon all the cases we receive from partners and others. And while we see that male leaders are killed um, and targeted at a higher rate when compared to women leaders, that women also experience different types of violence that is unique, um, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so women leaders um, receive threats of sexual violence, uh, derogatory gender comments, and other things that impede their participation um, as social leaders and in public life. And obviously worldviews on gender that are traditionalist and stereotypes still impact their experiences. So to know more about this today, we're gonna have the honor of hearing from Karen Stallone and Dr. Julia Zulfer. 
Um, we are very grateful to have Dr. Zulfer back. Um, she, not too long ago, presented her book on Colombian feminist activists, which is really a seminal work that is very important for raising visibility of these courageous women and the vital work that they do. Um, she is currently a Mary, okay, I'm going to destroy the way this is pronounced, I apologize, Sklodowska Curie Research Fellow, please correct me, <laughs> at Oxford and UNAM. And um, her colleague, Karen Stallone, is a PhD candidate in the Department of Sociology at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, Karen has also done a lot of extensive work on gendered issues surrounding internal armed conflicts. So we definitely have two of the leading experts on these issues here today. And what they'll specifically talk about and we will discuss is an article that's coming out soon called The Gendered Risks of Social Leadership in Contexts Governed by Armed Groups, Evidence from Columbia, uh, which is a piece that they'll describe more broadly what their research um, methodology was, but basically it's based on extensive um, interviews with social leaders. Um, I would start basically by first saying that one thing that really stood out for me from your research is that you state very plainly that gender matters. So um, I know that you guys have a presentation, but I hope that you can get to the crux of why um, gender matters and explaining um, how females are, are targeted very differently uh, due to gender. So I'm not sure which of the two of you is going to start first, but please go ahead, Julia. That would be me. And I'm just going to share my screen, put this into slideshow mode. Okay. Are we all seeing it? Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Jimena, and uh, everyone here at WOLA for, for having me back and for um, having me this time with my colleague Kieran, who is the very soon to be Dr. Stallone. She submitted the final draft of her thesis last week. I will brag on your behalf. Um, and we are going to be presenting about some research we did over the last year, year and a half, um, which is about to come out in a, a forthcoming publication that, that Kieran will, will talk a little more about. Um, and, and the name has slightly changed uh, since we submitted it to you, Jimena, but it's, it's essentially the same. It's the gendered, risks, the gendered risks of defending rights in armed conflict, evidence from Colombia. And over the next half an hour or so, we'll talk about what that research that we did looks like and, and what those main findings are, um, particularly uh, in so far as how and why gender matters when we're assessing and uh, understanding these these experiences of uh, being a human rights defender or a social leader in Colombia. So again, thank you so much for having us here today. And as Julia mentioned, this is a forthcoming article, but it's already in its final form. So we're very happy to share the PDF after we finish the presentation. We'll put our emails up on the screen and um, yeah, please reach out to us if you'd like to get more details on it. Great. So just to begin and kind of get the, the feeling for what the rest of the presentation is going to look like, we thought we'd start with a quote that came out of one of the interviews that we did. And this was with a woman human rights um, defender in Colombia, we would call him a social leader, uh, who works around environmental activism. And she was she's based in, in Putumayo. And she told us that I feel that as a woman, as a minority, we are very exposed as a target for threats. Somehow as women, we're seen as defenseless, helpless, and this puts us at a disadvantage. And so this really kind of shapes what we were looking for, and we'll get more into it. But through the course of, of my PhD and book research, Kieran's PhD research, what we found time and time again is that women engaged in this social leadership or in the, these, these roles as human rights defenders tell us in qualitative ways, in words, that what they do is different from what their male um, counterparts are doing, that they face different risks, that the context is different. And so what we really wanted to do in this piece was look at this in a, a more systematic way. We know from and many of you on this call will know that it's different. There are these kind of differences around 
the lived experience of what it means to put yourself at the front lines of activism in, in Colombia today, I'm mean, post-accord Colombia, but we wanted to work at really teasing out what those differences are and then what the policy implications of those might be. Okay, so to begin, what do we know about conflicts? War and conflict disrupt political and social processes around the world, including civilian efforts to organize on the ground. And in these conflict spaces, armed groups seek social and territorial dominance, and they often suppress civilian organizing to establish that control and to establish that order. So these armed groups use violence against community leaders and human rights defenders to set an example, to teach others in society that they are the ones in power. And although not all armed groups are interested in total hegemony, and some do actually opt for alliances with local populations, threatening and murdering leaders is a common strategy to get control, especially in places where terrain is contested and where armed groups are competing with one another for dominance. And when it comes to conflict and gendered stereotypes, what we know, and this is not only from the Colombian context, although there is a lot of evidence that comes out of Colombia that supports this, is that women, uh, broadly speaking, not just leaders, experience conflict differently based on their gender. Um, some theorists talk about this in terms of a continuum of violence where we see the different intersections of economic life, political life, social life coming together to impact women in a way different from, from men. Uh, but we've also seen that women have agency in conflict. And so this is where I will self-reference again back to my book, where we can see that in Colombia, but, but around the world, women do engage in activism or what I call high-risk feminism to promote gender justice or feminist visions of peace. And in this article, uh, which is an academic piece that kind of draws from these theoretical canons, we also drew a lot on literature around women's political mobilizing and understandings of violence against women in politics. So what we mean by that is that women politicians face violence, not just because of their political agendas, although that does play into it, but because of their gender, because of the fact that they're women and all of the socially constructed stereotypes that go with that. Um, and rather than just their political views. So we see there that women who get into these political positions and most of the literature here is focusing on formal politics. So, um, so kind of looking at, at government within, within democratic systems, focusing on the way that women are discriminated against because of being women in these spaces. And we brought together these different bodies of literature to begin to do the analysis for the research that we, now we will, we will finally get to. So the term social leader is widely used in Colombia um, and social leaders, for those who, in case we have some on the call who don't work on the Colombian context specifically, social leaders are community leaders and human rights defenders who carry out public facing work in the interests of vulnerable civilians and vulnerable communities and members of society. But while we have plenty of studies on the deaths and threats against activists, this research has failed to assess the gender dimensions of the risks that people face as leaders. Instead, existing research has tended to focus on women and men human rights defenders together. Studies also differentiate by leadership type. So for instance, participation in different types of social leadership organizations, land rights, local government, Afro-Colombian rights, indigenous rights, crop substitution, as opposed to gender. And then lastly, as Jimena highlighted earlier, there are many statistics that tell us that men social leaders are killed at a much higher rate. The rate that we captured from data by Indepas is seven to one. Men are killed more than women. Um, but most analyses don't really shine a light on women's mobilizing. And so this led, this led us to our research question, what are the gendered risks of social leadership in Colombian armed conflict zones? And I, I kind of alluded to this before, but one of the things uh, that, that we wanted to show and highlight here was that we've been told time and time again, and those of you on this call who do field work in Colombia will, will likely have heard the same thing, that being a woman social leader is just fundamentally different from being a male social leader. That's not to say it's more important. Uh, you know, when we look at those numbers of seven to one, uh, when we look at murders, 
men to women. That's not saying that women are important. We need to study them more. We need to study them um, in, in a way that kind of that prioritizes focus on them. However, what we're saying is that if you just focus on those numbers, there would perhaps be kind of an impulse to center on those male social leaders who are being killed. And what we said in this paper is, if we look at threat content rather than numbers of murders, and we really differentiate that by men versus women to see kind of where those gendered stereotypes come out, we might get more in, uh, more, uh, more in-depth information about what those differences actually look like and how those need to be responded to. So again, for Colombianists, this is really uh, kind of uh, going to be a bit redundant, but for those of you who may not know the Colombian context, effectively what Jimena Ahmed said before, despite a 2016 peace agreement that ended over 50 years of war with the FARC, the Colombian conflict continues in many different ways with different actors around the territory. Uh, there are multiple armed groups that continue to, uh, to operate, so these include guerrilla groups like the FARC dissidents or the ELN, they're currently in peace talks. Uh, we also see paramilitaries and their successors and drug trafficking organizations. And what we see, you know, now having alluded to it multiple times, is that Colombia actually is the country in the world with the highest number of social leader, social leader assassinations. Um, and this is often used as a marker and indicator of the fact that the, uh, the ongoing conflict and the ongoing violent dynamics within Colombia, particularly in terms of those human rights abuses. So our methodology, as we mentioned already, most of the existing work on violence against Colombian social leaders lumps men and women together or focuses quantitatively on the murders. We know that more men leaders are killed at a seven to one ratio when compared to women and that a total of 1,217 leaders were murdered from 200, 2016 to 2021. To look at the gendered experiences of leadership, we focus specifically on threat content. So what types of threats did the leaders receive? How many? What exactly was said to them? And then we did 40 semi-structured interviews with 20 men and 20 women leaders who work in nine different conflict regions across the country. So this included Arauca, Bolívar, Cauca, Chocó, Cundinamarca, La Guajira, Norte de Santander, Putumayo, and Valle del Cauca. Um, and then from these interviews, which we conducted over the phone, we used the same structured questionnaire and then occasionally added in additional questions for detail to shed light on some of the additional patterns that we'll talk about today. Um, we found these people through our existing questions, through our existing networks between Julia and myself. We have almost 15 years of experience living and researching in Colombia. Um, and, and then in addition to the specific threats they received, we also asked these leaders about their specific type of activism and their views on protection. And so the findings. Um, when we did the, the sampling for our survey, we wanted, because we were going to analyze, analyze threat content, we wanted to, to ensure that all of the leaders that we were speaking to had received threats. So as a precursor for including them, um, they had received some kind of threat. So this was either via the phone, via um, pamphlets, so pieces of paper with written threats, often via WhatsApp or social media, sometimes in person. Um, and some of them had received one threat, some of them had received, I think one woman told us, you know, 500 threats. She may have been exaggerating, but she was really saying that this is a constant ongoing phenomenon. The work that they're doing exposes them to the, these kind of quotidian sites of violence. Um, and that that is reflected in, in, in threats and threats that they received from different armed actors. What we will say, and this is a bit of a limitation to the study, is that we didn't disaggregate by who had made those threats. And so this is going to differ depending on the part of the country, depending on the exact timing, depending on the different kind of activism. And often when we, we did ask, we did ask sometimes, often those who were interviewed didn't know. They didn't know exactly who it was. And if they had received, for example, 500 threats, we can assume that there's a bit of a mix in there. Uh, and so we didn't disaggregate there, but the, the implication was they had been threatened from an armed group, be that, um, paramilitary narco-trafficking or a guerrilla organization. Um, 
And what we found was that, as expected, the content and style of threats against women and men leaders were different and they were gendered. They were based in these gendered stereotypes of assumptions about what women's roles in society should be, what they definitely shouldn't be, which is engaging in um, political activism at uh, the civil society level. And then what men's roles are supposed to be and what men's roles are not supposed to be. And what emerged as we analyzed these 40 interviews with 20 men and 20 women were four patterns. The first was that um, both men and women, but much more women, and we'll explain in the next slide, uh, were receiving stay at home threats to prevent women's political empowerment. Uh, the second kinds of threats, and these applied only to women, none of the men interviewed, were around sexual violence. Uh, threats of sexual violence. The third, again, which applied to men and women, but in a very different and interesting way, were threats against family. And then finally, um, something that came up, which uh, impacted men and women differently, but again, did impact men and women, were derogatory, sexualized, racist, and gendered language um, coming through these threats. So to put it simply, and as Jimena said, our findings tell us that gender matters when it comes to assessing the targeting and violence against social leaders, even in contexts governed by armed actors who see both men and women as enemies. The patterns we found show that perpetrators hold genders, gendered views and biases about men and women, particularly how these men and women should exist in public space. Women leaders who challenge the authority of these armed actors face different and in some cases even more costly repercussions when compared to men leaders. And what we see is that these biases are rooted in socially constructed in a socially constructed binary between private space, the home, uh, the domestic sphere where women are supposed to be and public spaces where even though men are considered enemies or are considered threats to the dominance of these social groups, their uh, ability to operate in these public spaces is not being questioned in the same way that, it, that women are when, when they come out. And so here we're drawing again on this violence against women in politics literature to see that it's not just the issue or the theme or the actions, it's also the identity of the social leader. So being a woman and those threats that come because you are a woman social leader are not necessarily, although they are implicated, it's not necessarily about the, the particular lucha you have, it's also about the, the, your fact that you're a woman and you're engaging in this lucha in a public space. So okay. to, to get, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that's fine. So unlike our male interviewees, many of our female respondents, 13 out of 20, told us they received threats challenging their political empowerment, particularly their role and existence in public spaces as opposed to the private space of the home. The women we interviewed were told to go back home today to dedicate themselves to cleaning their home spaces and to taking care of their children effectively in the eyes of the perpetrators to go home back where they belong. Um, in other words, this finding reflects perpetrators gendered views on the public private divide, as Julia was just saying. Um, one woman, for example, told us about a threatening phone call during which she was told that she should dedicate her time to taking care of her children instead of being a snitch in places where she shouldn't, in the street. Next slide. Um, and so here's some additional direct threat quotes that the, that the leaders received and shared with us. So one woman, she was told, you bitch, go look for a job instead of messing around in the street. You should go and cook, you should go and clean. And this was a leader from Buenaventura in Valle del Cauca. And another woman from Tumaco in Nariño received a threat saying, these are men's issues and you should be in your house doing housework. And in comparison to women, the threats that men received about their home lives focused on masculine roles of providing for or protecting the family. Women were told to clean their houses, while men were actually encouraged to re return to the jobs they had before they began their work as activists. So unlike women, the threats men leaders received were not rooted in assumptions that men should not, not be engaged in public space and were instead premised upon stereotypical masculine roles as protectors and providers. And so here we have a quote from a man leader from Buenaventura saying, I've been told you don't value your family. 
why don't you dedicate yourself to your profession? Since you're a teacher, you should stick to teaching, you son of a bitch. And so the second um, kind of pattern that really emerged was around sexual violence threats. And we found that about 30% of women reported that threat content, the threats they'd received included threats of sexual violence. Um, and of all of the 20 men we interviewed, not a single man had received a threat related uh, to, to sexual violence. So these included um, rape threats against women leaders, but also against their children. And here, for example, um, a woman leader from Montes de Maria told us that she had received a threat where the content was along the lines of, we're going to rape you again, we're going to rape your daughter just to hurt you. And so we see again that there are these kind of gendered understandings from these armed actors of what kinds of threats are going to impact women particularly. So what we also see, and Kieran alluded to this before in the stay at home threats, um, are these threats against family. We've also seen this now in the sexual violence threats, uh, attacks or, or kind of uh, threats of attacks against, against women's daughters. When it came to threats against family, we actually saw that 90% of the women leaders had received threat content that included these um, kind of extended threats, not only against them, but against uh, their, their close families. And 55% of men also did receive these threats. However, we see that the, the kind of nature of these threats are a little different. The threats are drawing on family bonds uh, or these ideas of kind of if we threaten your family, perhaps that will be a deterrent to ensure compliance with the rules that are imposed by these armed groups. And this is a place where we saw that both men and women were being uh, were getting the same content. But as above, it was in terms of women about the acceptable place. So women's role as mothers, women's roles as taking care of family. It was a threat against that in terms of what a woman's acceptable place is and a way to deter her or stop her from engaging in public activism was to involve her family. Whereas when it came to men, it was much more about a protective role. So stop doing what you're doing. What you should be doing is taking care of your family based on these very stereotypical ideas about what a mother or a father's role within a family should be. And so, for example, we saw from a woman a leader in Tumaco, she said, for us women, it is much more difficult because we're mothers, we have children. When they can't get to you directly, they start with the weakest parts where they know that it'll hurt most. And interestingly, a male leader from Cauca told us a similar thing. He said, our weak points are always our families. They look for them, identify them, point them out, follow them home, watch them. This is a way of threatening us. So of the women and men we interviewed, many also reported that the threats they received used derogatory, sexualized, and gendered language. This wasn't part of our addition, or part of our initial original survey, so we didn't break it down into percentages or charts in the way that we did in the previous categories. Instead, we just pulled out what we found when we assessed the patterns because it came up repeatedly. So some women reported that the threats they received accused them of being lesbians, particularly if their activism centered on helping other women overcome um, sexual and domestic violence. In these cases, homosexuality was used in a derogatory context within the threats and implied that the threat makers saw being a lesbian as a form of deviance. No men interviewed for the project received such comments or threats related to their sexuality. Although we do at the end of the paper suggest that this would be an important additional research direction to conduct a series of interviews with LGBT activists across the country and a much more wider survey base. Um, in some cases, the women we interviewed were also called whores, and this language is clearly gendered. And this type of threat implies that women are sexually, sexually liberal and that threat makers see this as derogatory. These types of threats against women, but not men, rely on a heteronormative view of sexuality and show us how threat makers conceptualize what or who a woman should be. In this case, not a whore and also not a lesbian. And then another type of threat that women received suggested that their activism for women's rights was caused by man-hating after an unsatisfactory sexual experience. So the quote on the screen that you see is from a woman leader 
from Norte de Santander, who was told by armed groups that clearly you've been fucked wrong in the past and kind of alluding to, oh, this is why you're an activist today. Um, we saw though also that men and women leaders had both reported uh, receiving racist threats, particularly um, related to those who were working on ensuring racial, ethnic or territorial rights. Um, so conversations with Afro and indigenous leaders whose activism centers around these particular areas of activism um, were told that this was, that we're kind of used this, this language to denigrate them as well, or to uh, take away from their, uh, from their authority in the community. Again, as Kieran said, we didn't actively ask about this intersecting identity, looking at uh, race or ethnicity. However, it came up enough times that again, we think that that would be something interesting to include in future studies. So for example, a male leader from Montes de Maria in El Carmen de Bolivar told us, that after he received a threat that said, you know, he said I was a black son of a bitch because I had power and I thought I was immortal. And he said that they also had power and that they that they were going to use it against me. So we see here, and this happened with women as well, those kind of intersecting kinds of threats, which are trying to uh, de-establish or to take away some of the power of these social leaders, not only by um, putting them into these gendered binaries, but also uh, looking at other identities related to race, ethnicity, um, and as Kira mentioned before, uh, particularly heteronormative, heteronormative ideas around sexuality. So given that leaders, both men and women, are receiving these series of threats, what is the reporting status and what are the challenges that come with that? As a part of the peace accords in 2016, the Colombian government established a reporting mechanism and a protection agency called the National Protection Unit, the UNP, for its initials in Spanish. This is supposed to provide security for those at risk of violence, specifically social leaders. But in our research, both men and women leaders shared frustrations regarding the reporting process to state authorities and to others receiving their declarations. In some cases, they said reporting actually put them in danger due to connections or links between local police and armed groups, or because they were being watched and they worried that if they reported to the authorities, they would face violent retribution for being sapos or snitches. Um, one woman leader in Tumaco told us that when she receives threats, she never reports to the police or the Fiscalia due to fear and lack of credibility in these authorities. She told us that reporting is a risk because when others have reported to the police or the Fiscalia within hours, within seconds, they receive threats saying, we know what you've done. Some women leaders we interviewed also experienced uniquely gendered prejudice when trying to report to public officials. So for example, when a woman leader from Catatumbo we interviewed attempted to report to an official at her local fiscalia or public prosecutor's office here in Colombia, the official accused her of being the girlfriend of a guerrillero rebel and said that her organization was working with armed groups. The same official then commented that she must have been wearing a short dress, implying that she was at fault. And then another woman from Putumayo told us that when she reported threats to the local authorities, she was told that she shouldn't worry and that maybe the threat makers were just in love with her. Um, she told us that she felt her experiences were minimized when speaking to the authorities, and they clearly were. Uh, and so effectively, these statements show us that after gender, gender threats by armed groups, some women actually face a second round of violence when they attempt to report the crimes. And so what we see in terms of conclusions is that men and women social leaders are threatened by these armed groups, not only because of their activism, but also because of their gender identities. Um, we're not discounting that men receive threats. We're not discounting that men are actually killed in significantly higher numbers. But what we are uh, highlighting is that when women activists are threatened, they receive threats that directly challenge their right to exist and work in public spaces, as opposed to the private space, the acceptable space of the home. We also saw that women uh, received sexual violence threats that no men did receive. That's not to say that no men have ever received sexual violence but, uh, threats, but, but when it comes to the men we interviewed, that was 
a pattern that, that was um, revealed. And we also saw, as Kieran just mentioned, that men and women leaders report being treated very differently by authorities when they tried to report a threat. Um, when male leaders did report, even though many of them didn't have great experiences or didn't necessarily feel that the resulting security schemes that they got actually protected them, they didn't feel as though their credibility as social leaders was being undermined. Whereas, as we saw before with Ke and in the side Kieran just presented, women did report that not only were the uh, protection schemes they received not uh, adequate to the context in which they live or to their identities as women, but also that they were being uh, re-victimized by public officials when they were trying to claim that they had received threats of violence within these uh, public spaces. And then again, it, all of this comes to say, like, why does gender matter? It shows that these armed groups, and these are different armed groups, as I mentioned, we didn't disaggregate by which uh, specific faction we're talking about, but all of these groups, to a certain extent, rely on traditionalist worldviews that are related to women's acceptable places in society. And when women transgress what's acceptable, when they leave the home, when they engage in making demands for justice in public spaces, they face gender specific violence, which is effectively telling them to return to where they belong. And so in terms of uh, policy recommendations, uh, we have a few different things that we wanted to highlight, but we'll be really happy to chat about these more uh, in the, the question and answers, which we'll get to shortly. And I think that this is particularly important because uh, as Jimena was mentioning at the beginning in the current government of Gustavo Petro, there are efforts to uh, renew or to change up some of how the UNEP is going to be working. And so I think that these are particularly salient, salient at, a, at a moment like we have right now where there's, there's room to potentially make some changes. So the first point that we wanted to make was that the government responses to threats and attacks need to reflect these gender differences that we've just talked about when it comes to social leaders. So for example, this means creating enabling conditions for social uh, leaders and activists, but with this gendered lens. So for example, protection mechanisms that take women's bodies into account. What do we mean there? We've been told time and time again, not only in this particular piece of research, but in uh, the research we've both done um, for, for other kind of academic purposes that the ONP, one of their first lines of defense is to give social leaders or those who need protection um, a bulletproof vest and a cell phone. And what the women leaders we spoke to have said is, you know, that these are designed for men's bodies and they squish them. They, they don't fit women's bodies. They're not designed for women. Um, they're particularly not designed for women living in very hot and humid climates. And so that just frankly does not work for them. Secondly, that these mechanisms include women's own risk assessments. These are going to be specific to their territories. While we found patterns across the country, we know that the dynamics of conflict in Putumayo are different than what's going on in La Guajira, which is slightly different than what's going on in um, Valle del Cauca. And so a lot of the women's organizations that we have worked with over the years of research have done really detailed um, and context specific risk analyses, which give very concrete recommendations about what they would like in terms of protection. And so actually factoring those into some of the ways that these schemes or these protection mechanisms are granted um, would allow for these gender differences to be reflected. And then also understanding that when women are uh, behaving or acting in these social leadership roles, that they do have uh, other responsibilities that do often fall along these lines of men's and women's roles. So social me or protection mechanisms, sorry, particularly because of these threats against family um, that are going to incorporate children or uh, different kinds of security that are going to allow for children to be included um, when we think about how women move through their territories, how they get to and from the places where they're engaging with public officials, the times of day that these meetings or these different spaces are often um, convened for thinking, for example, about uh, children and, and school hours. And so factoring those in uh, can be done fairly easily by simply speaking to women social leaders about what a responsive protection mechanism that does take this gendered focus would look like. In terms of another slightly more um, straightforward and easy to implement suggestion, we would need sensitivity training for police and other entities who receive reports of the threats. As we've already said over and over again, we received comments that police didn't 
adequately or even appropriately respond to the crimes and the violence that women were trying to tell them. And so, of course, we've also acknowledged that there's a wide degree of police corruption. We recognize that's a much deeper issue that has to be addressed, you know, from multiple levels, and that isn't isn't a short-term solution at all. But in the meantime, sensitivity trainings for police, this is something that could be implemented. This is something that a program could be established just to go to these places that are receiving declarations and, and make sure that they understand these differences, these gender differences and dynamics. Um, the next thing is that we believe funding bodies and donors should also consider how women's activism is dangerous because of the uniquely genderous threat, gender threats and biases, and they should guarantee protection and resources to compensate for these risks. And so that just means in some of the ways that Julia has just mentioned, that means addressing funds for those specific initiatives and moving forward from there. But most importantly, we really think that it's important just to hear their voices and to listen to what these local women and local men are saying about the violence that they face and what would be best for them. So with that, we will finish talking and pass back to you, Jimena. But here in the meanwhile are our contacts and I think uh, Jimena will be uh, facilitating some of the sharing of, of um, the, uh, the article as, as it becomes available. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. And it's so important because often we hear about, yes, there are, you know, anecdotally um, differences, but no one's actually gone and like put together what those differences are. And, you know, uh, it's been fascinating to see that. Um, so we already have one question. So I'm going to go ahead. It's from Matthew. Hi, Matthew. Um, and he says, thank you for your insights. This is an important assessment on gender-based persecution in the country. You mentioned the need for more studies on LGBTQ plus activists and how they face gender-based violence. Having conducted this specific study, what advice do you have for conducting future studies? That's one. Another that um, I just wanna add, and I encourage others to please uh, post more questions in the chat is, um, while she's not and no longer is a social leader, um, Francia Marquez, um, it's been very interesting or, or, or sad to see these derogatory um, and racist threats against her. And uh, given that um, Julia, in particular in your prior book, you, you did talk about her and so forth, I was wondering what your point of view was in terms of um, that dynamic um, that's taken hold given the fact that she's achieved a certain level of power and is not the usual actor to be in, in that um, form of power. Um, and then also secondly, um, when you have talked to authorities, if you have, um, do you have any strategies for how to get them interested in these issues? This is something that came up yesterday. We had a like mini gender training and, and something that happens in Latin America and also here in the US is as soon as we say that something's about gender or about women, um, we get a lot less of an attention span or interest. And so I was just wondering if you all had any input on how to make those issues more um, interesting or in, or make it more interesting in, in these different contexts, given um, all of these stereotypes and so forth. I can start with going a little bit backwards. And then Julia, do you want to jump in and answer the Francia Marquez question? Um, so in terms of getting people interested in topics about gender, that's been a real challenge. And that is something that we actually did with this paper. We included both men and women in the study of gender, which is how it should be. Gen studies of gender are not just women. And I think that having that combination is is really important to show people that it's not just a women's issue. This affects this affects all of us. Gender is something, gender dynamics is something that we all need to be paying attention to. And then in terms of the question from Matthew, yes, if we were to do this study again, or if we were to encourage others to work on these topics, we would we would like to advocate for much bigger sample sizes. Um, for this project, we conducted 40 
40 interviews and, and we found that there is variation, but we weren't able to go deeply enough into that variation because we had a sample of 40 as, a, as opposed to a sample of 300 or 400. Um, and then in terms of looking at the LGBT population, that's important. And it's important to break down the categories, look at lesbian leaders, look at gay leaders, look at trans leaders, look at bisexual leaders, because there's huge variation within that as well. Um, and the last thing I would say is to, well, yeah, yeah Juliet, you go ahead and, and add on there. One of the things I was going to say in terms of um, getting others interested, and this comes from some other police trainings that I provided in a totally different context. Oh, not totally, it was in Colombia, but it was around um, not re-victimizing um, survivors of sexual violence, particularly um, in terms of the, the Venezuelan migration population. And one of the things I found in, in doing some of these trainings, and it perhaps sounds like a basic thing, is, is not being accusatory. So often one, these, these, uh, these sessions went people the, the police people who came kind of came with a, with an understanding that they were going to be criticized or that they were going to be told that you're sexist or they were going to be told that you're you know xenophobic when it came to Venezuelan women and so beginning on really e kind of a really even footing of saying you know this is not necessarily just about criticizing and saying you're this and saying you're that but trying to get people involved by using language that they understand, using examples that they understand, not getting too technical and not um, using kind of academic jargon. Those are really simple things that made the subsequent trainings that we did over time much more effective. Um, I found at least, and again, this is anecdotal, I'm, I'm not an expert in police trainings, but I found that if people feel as though they're going to be attacked or if they're going to be criticized, they're much less receptive and they're much more defensive when it comes to engaging in these kinds of really important sensitivity trainings. And so finding ways to use examples, to use direct examples, to use, you know, as we did today, some of the language, some of the quotes from people who have, um, you know, suffered re-victimization, for example, with public authorities, have, have made the spaces much more um, collaborative, have made people much more accepting and receptive to these sorts of of training. Um, and then in terms of, of Francia Marquez, I mean, I think that goes back to, unfortunately, you know, not only kind of the violence against women in politics literature, although perhaps it it is against, it is there. It's, it's trying to delegitimize someone not based on their political views necessarily, although that often is the fundamental issue. Um, that, you know, Francia Marquez represents everything that the Colombian political status quo is not. And she is therefore in a position of power and seen by many as a threat. And so it's trying to delegitimize her based on her race, based on her social leader background, based on her gender. And as we saw, it kind of, it, it shows us, it holds up a mirror almost to what society or what these threat makers think society should look like who should be in positions of power. And if that's not what they see reflected in their politicians, that can be threatening. And so they use pretty facile ways to try and decredit or delegitimize those political leaders. Um, and we see that when it comes to women, as I mentioned before, it's not just, you know, her perhaps um, more socialist views, it's that she has these views and she is a woman. So it's directly based on her identity. And so, it's, it's, I think, legitimizing that those threats do happen and that they're, um, they're, they're not correct, that they have no place in, um, in kind of democratic political debate. But unfortunately, we see this as a pattern, um, not only in Colombia, but, but beyond. And then Matthew, I'm just gonna put one small comment in the Q&A chat box there that I think also might be interesting to you. Thanks, we got a whole bunch of other questions, so I'm just going to go through them quickly so that we can get answers and responses from you. Um, so a great presentation and 100% agree with the comment about including men in research on gender. My question is, do you have any thoughts on the implications of your findings for participatory research partnerships between academics and social leaders, fundaciones in Colombia? Another question is, what is the role of hegemonic masculinity in the ways social leaders experience violence? 
Um, then we have a comment um, that I will translate, which is, it is important to be able to build the capacity of um, policymakers or, or people who work in agencies and public um, service persons and judicial authorities, since they're the first ones who have to uh, be responsible for receiving the information. And at the same time, they're the ones who could be the potential uh, first re-victimizers due to the actions and the missions that they take. Um, another question is uh, comment, hi all, thanks for doing this. Can you talk a little more about the implications of these threats? Did it stop any of these women leaders from serving in their position? Do they mostly consider them empty threats or do they take specific precautions because of them? Did you find any examples of specific threats that were actually carried out on the leaders you spoke to? Um, another uh, comment is in the studies that have been done by analysts from the National Protection U Unit, um, it should have the option that women analysts can be uh, the ones taking care of the cases having to do with women because the fact that it, there are men uh, can limit sometimes um, the expression of the actual woman who's under threat and um, what you know she might be presenting. So let's do that and then I'll go to the others because it's already a lot. I don't okay. know. I can, I, I can start with the with the first two. So I agree that participatory research partnerships are amazing. And I think these partnerships would be an ideal way to gain further information about some of the topics that we've talked about today, particularly if we can bring on these social leaders and include them both financially and as researchers driving the agenda. Um, I'm thinking about some examples of research programs that I've heard about over the years. I know some universities offer opportunities for researchers to actually partner with local organizations. And I think that's fantastic because that's a way of providing financial support for the researcher and also for the local organization and really using that funding to move the move the agenda forward. And in terms of the question about hegemonic masculinity, so that's really the root of this discrimination that we've highlighted today. So hegemonic masculinity is they legitimize men's dominant positions in society. And that's very closely linked to the militarized masculinities that we're talking about, that these armed groups are putting forward with beliefs that women should be in the home, that men are the decision makers, that women can't be activists because they need to be taking care of children. Um, and these are the mentalities that punish women for their mere existence in public space. Um, Julia, do you want to add on to those or do you want to go to the, to the next ones? I was going to go to the next one just for the sake of time. I think Austin, um, I, I don't think that people take these as empty threats, particularly as they see people around them being murdered at these incredibly high rates. That is, you know, a whole, a whole other paper, a whole other um, kind of understanding of why people continue to mobilize despite these threats. Um, that's a lot of the focus of, of my own kind of separate research. Why do we see social leaders, particularly women social leaders, continuing to take on these incredibly public roles when, when these aren't empty threats, when we do see that people around them um, are getting you know, attacked, are getting murdered, um, that these armed groups, I think, have made it very clear that they are willing to and will make good on these threats. Not always, but you don't need it to be always. You just need it to be once. Um, yet, yeah, everyone we talked to, we did actually ask the question, have you ever considered or would you consider stopping to engage in, in the activism that you do? And most of them said, and, and I mean, I haven't consulted the, the database in a little while, but most of them said, we have considered it. There are moments where we really have to bajar el perfil, like to really kind of lower our profile when we know that, for example, there's um, certain groups that are clashing when we see that others around us are actually being attacked and not just threatened. And so it's these ongoing, very context specific risk assessments that then kind of drive action. So sometimes yes, sometimes no. Sometimes they'll continue, sometimes they'll kind of Bring them, bring their profile down a little bit, um, but but yeah, that's that's kind of what I would 
I would say in terms of that and in terms of specific precautions, um, yeah, they, they definitely do kind of figure out local ways to protect themselves, um, how, different kind of ways that, that complement or make up for the, the gaps and what they would say that the Winnipe offers them. Great. Well, I mean, I think that you guys did a really good job because um, it's opened up a Pandora's box of more questions than many other things. So it means that definitely just scratched the surface. Um, so two other questions, and then I just have another comment. So the peace process and transitional justice mechanisms have been described as groundbreaking for their incorporation of gender and ethnicity mainstreaming. How effective do you think the Gender Commission has been in terms of the implementation of the peace process and transitional justice mechanisms? Were you able to speak to officials overseeing the implementation of these processes? Um, and then the second question is, how do you think your positionality as white women conducting this research affected results and narrative shared during this study? And then just to comment, um, one thing that would be interesting um, to also look at, just because anecdotally is something I've heard from a lot of female social leaders, is uh, basically the hard decisions that they have to make in terms of separating from their children. So again, Francia Mark is no longer a social leader, but in a recent article she did for El País, she mentioned how she's had to send both of her kids out of the country. Uh, because of this and how she's had to separate from her family and very much isolate um, in order to protect them. And so my question would be, how does that differ between men and women? You know, um, in the case of male social leaders, are they able to rely on uh, their wife or or whomever to, or family member to take their children and, you know, allow them to do the work? Or is it harder for women? Also, what is the situation in terms of their relationships? Another thing that I've heard a lot from um, social leader women, again, anecdotally, is the fact that they um, they end up not having <laughs> uh, steady uh, partnerships because of the partner um, and the situation of their leadership and so forth and protection and what have you. So, you know, um, I don't know if you got any sort of insight on any of those things um, during your your study that you can comment on. Okay, so in terms of the question about the gendered commission and the implementation of the peace process, to my knowledge, the last statistic that I heard about this was that approximately, and correct me if I'm wrong, Julia, 50% of the peace um, agenda related to women has been implemented and there's still a majority that has not. Um, so that, again, was not, that's knowledge that I have uh, aside from this project, that wasn't the focus of this project, but, um, but that is definitely a future important, very important research agenda that we need to look into further. Um, and then in terms of positionality as white women conducting this research and how this affects the results and narrative shared during the study, shared during the study, you know, positionality is something that's always important to acknowledge. And we do acknowledge our positionality as two white and foreign women doing this research in Colombia. And of course, it's very possible that this affects results in, in any research project. And then my, my main response with this would be in an ideal world, we would have enough funding to hire people to to hire an indigenous person to conduct the interviews with the indigenous communities we would hire um we would hire an afro-colombian person to do the interviews with the afro communities um we didn't have that as an option in this case um but yeah that's that's the nature of, of research and julia do you want to add anything further to that I mean, just to say that again, positionality is a much bigger question as Kieran said at the beginning, like most of the people that we ended up interviewing came through our existing network. So these are people who we've known and had a trust relationship with for a long time. I would say also sometimes that being interviewed by people outside of the community sometimes does give a different kind of set of responses um, in the sense that 
you know, via a phone interview, we're, you know, not directly there. There's, there's not as sometimes a feeling that there's like the word not as much of a threat as for, for example, someone who's more local, who's asking these questions, you know, why do you need this information? And so there's a whole gamut of responses there. Um, and then I think just finally, kind of Humana, as you said, one of the things we did find, and again, we didn't uh, kind of analyze it directly, but exactly as you said, often women do have kids and, and the women are kind of stuck with their children in the sense that if women leaders, you know, decide, and some of them do like Francia, like some of the others here, and I see you nodding, had to kind of send their kids away to the big city or to the nearby town. And that this was a real kind of rapture in their family life because, because there are still those norms, the exact same norms, which we've been talking about throughout this presentation that mean that women are seen as, women who are mothers have to be with their kids. Whereas that cost of a, ma man, uh, of a male leader leaving his family and leaving it with his wife or girlfriend or partner, I think sometimes is lower. That's not to say it's not a cost. That's not to say it's not an emotional burden, but I think often it's less complicated logistically um, for a, a man to, to kind of participate in these spaces. I see that we're a minute or two over time, so I'll leave it there. Um, sure. So just the final one that came in was, um, why did you use phone interviews and what opportunities do you think technology creates for research on sensitive topics like this? And then any final words either of you want to say uh, to close? So we used phone interviews because we actually began this research during the peak of the pandemic when we couldn't do in-person interviews. And yes, this, that is one of the main advantages. We were able to do a research project during the pandemic. Um, there are also disadvantages to phone interviews. You know, you're not actually seeing a person's facial expressions. You're not in the space where they're working. There are many other things you can capture with a live interview that you can't with a phone interview. But I think that because of the nature of this project, that was a huge advantage to be able to do those interviews at that time. Um, in terms of general closing remarks, we're just grateful to have all of you here to listen to this research, and we hope if you're in the position to make policy decisions or direct funding, that you will take these findings into account and, and as we move forward to attempt to protect leaders and take these gender dimensions into account. Karen said it perfectly, so I'll leave it at that. Yeah, so I will just say that definitely uh, on the part of WOLA, we will take into account your recommendations and see how we can incorporate it into the advocacy that we do um, when it comes to um, the threats and, and attacks against uh, female defenders. Um, and really, I think that this is very exciting work, and I, I really hope that you all after you finish this one, go into all of these other questions that people raised and others, because we need a lot more visibility of these issues. We need a lot more thinking of these issues, um, you know, relying just on anecdotal is not helpful. Um, and so just to say that uh, we love academic contributions to um, Columbia work and so forth. And, and we hope that um, you continue to do that. And we look forward to seeing what you will be doing next. Um, and I also just want to thank everybody else for participating and ask that you follow um, Julia and Kieran on social media so that when their full article comes out, you get to read all of it in full detail. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.